if you have your Bibles with this morning, 1 John chapter 2, verse number 12. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 12. Hope that you enjoyed Sunday school back this morning for the first time in a long time. It feels like it's been much longer than it has been, but I'm glad that we were able to start back. Uh, I know that there may have been some bugs that we need to work out or kinks that are in there. So um, if you have some suggestions or you saw some things that were concerning or things that we may can improve on or try to do better in um, to get us to where we need to be, to where we're back to doing everything normal and uh, things like that, if you'll let us know, we'll try our best to work those things uh, in. First John chapter 2, verse number 12, I've titled the sermon this morning, Caution, the world is out to get you. Now, you know, sometimes we uh, get into this mindset that we're trying to scare everybody to death and that the world's trying to scare us to death and the church is trying to scare us to death and our employers are trying to scare us to death and the government's trying to scare us to death. Uh, and, and, and sometimes we need to have some visual things here. So this morning, uh, as I was putting this sermon together, I, I, I visualized this caution sign for a moment. So try to visualize this caution sign. I think there's a uh, you know, the signs that we have to observe on the roads and stuff, there are signs that we ought to take and apply into our spiritual lives as well. So there's some stop signs, there's caution signs, there's yield signs, there's all kinds of signs that are out there that we can take and apply to our spiritual life. And so since I get to drive around a lot all the time looking at these signs and things like that, I try to find a way to apply them into my spiritual life. life. And so this one is this, caution, the world is out to get you. Now, I think that's something that we need to be reminded of as Christians. That the world is against us, and because the world is against us, I tell you this, that the world is really out to get us as Christians, as uh, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, I think, or excuse me, John, uh, 1 John chapter 2 hits it uh, on the head, starting at verse number 12, and listen to what he says. He says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write, write unto you, fathers, because you have known him, that is from the beginning. And I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. And I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that from the beginning. That is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Verse 17. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Let us pray. Father, in these next few moments, as we spend time digging into your word, as you speak to us about some of the signs in life. This one of those caution signs. When we read through the pages of Scripture, we, we can apply and we can see those signs. And this is one of those caution signs to where it's saying, caution, be aware, the world's out to get you. It's not something that should frighten us. It's something that we have to be aware of. It's a caution sign. They're all around us. Help us to take them and apply them into our spiritual lives. And Father, this morning as we dig through the pages of Scripture, speak to us, your children, fresh and anew from your word today. Give us a, a fresh understanding, a biblical understanding from your word today that we can take and apply to our lives. Help us to leave this place this morning better than when we were when we walked in. And Father, help us to take the word of God with us. Not to keep it, but to spread it to those who are hurting, those who are lost, and for those who are desiring to hear truth. Take me now, your messenger, speak through me the words that we, your people, stand in need of, which in the precious and holy name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Three things that John wants to uh, try to teach us in this particular passage of Scripture. I want to give them to you. I want you to write them down for the caution signs. First is this. In order for us to understand the world and the world that's out to get us, we must first learn to grow. One of the things that I found out in our spiritual lives is this, that sometimes we're satisfied to where we are in life spiritually and we fail to take those steps 
of growth. Notice what he says, I write unto you little children because your sins have been forgiven for my name's sake. I write unto you fathers because you have known him from the beginning. I write unto you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. Uh, Paul begins to talk about these three different groups of people that he's writing to here in this, in, in this particular passage of Scripture. He talks about the little children. He talks about the young men. He talks about the father. I have heard this taught time and time again, and some say he's focusing in on these different age groups of people. He's talking about these young people, and then he's talking about uh, or, or the, the children, and he's talking about the middle age group of people, and then he's talking about uh, the older generation. Uh, and, and I hear them say that, that this is how it applies biblically in this particular passage to young children and to, uh, to middle aged people and to, to older uh, individuals. But I've come to realize that that's not what Paul's talking about, or the judge's talking about at all in this particular passage of Scripture. What John is talking about in this particular passage of Scripture is not categories of age and gender. He's talking about stages of spiritual growth. And so I think that you have to understand what he's talking about before you can read this passage of Scripture and it pop out and say, hey, this is the caution sign. He's talking about the stages of spiritual growth. For the fact of the matter is, a person can be 60, 70, 80 years old and still be a child, spiritually speaking. And it is also possible for a female to be a father in the spiritual sense that they could be spiritually mature. And so that's not, uh, so what John is talking about is not these different age groups. He's talking about uh, these different stages in spiritual growth, spiritual infancy, little children. Uh, he's referring to uh, those who are uh, weak in their faith, those who are just beginning in their faith. I, I want to say this. I think it's awesome uh, that churches and that our church is filled with individuals who are children, who remain children, uh, not only age-wise, but I think it's awesome that people uh, are children in their spiritual life as well. But the goal for the church is this, not for you to remain as a child spiritually, but for you to grow into that next stage of life and then uh, grow on into the stage of maturity to where you need to be so that you can be useful to the church, so that you can have impact on your community, so that you can be useful into the kingdom of God. So you can't stay in that, that spiritual uh, baby stage, that childlike Stage. And he talks about the young men, the, the adolescent stage, in, in terms of young men and young women being in that adolescent stage to where you know for a fact that God loves you, begin to uh, experience some of that love, you begin to share some of that love. And then he talks about the fathers, which is this mature, maturity stage, to where not only you have experienced what God has done for you, not only have you been through the fire, and you're still trusting in the Father. But from the experiences that you go through in your spiritual life, you have gotten to that point that you have said, you know what, I'm expecting certain things to happen. When those things happen, I'm going to trust in God regardless. That's the spiritual maturity stage that he's talking about. And so what John is saying here, that he wants whatever stage you are in your spiritual life, your Christian life, to consider what God has done for you. And so whether you're a child in your spiritual life, whether you're an adolescent in your spiritual life, or whether you're an adult in your spiritual life, consider what God has done for you at that stage in your life. And once you grasp what God has done for you at that stage, then you can begin to move on to the next stage of your spiritual life. So what John is saying here is that new believers, new uh, children in Christ, uh, remember that your sins have been forgiven, and now you know the Father. For those who have moved on in life into that adolescent stage, not only do you know that God loves you and that God cares for you, but you understand that your foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're beginning to grow and experience some victories in your spiritual life. And to those who have become fully mature believers, those fathers that he's talking about here, that you come to the point in your life to where you walk and you realize that everything in this life is simply knowing God and knowing more about God and watching the providential hand of the Father, the sovereign hand of the Father at work in our world no matter where you find yourself in this life. That's the three stages that John uh, is talking about. And so he wants to, to encourage us to continue to grow more and more and more. From the infant stage to the adolescent stage to the maturity stage. And the only way that you can go from stage one to stage two to stage three is through the transforming power of the Word of God. So it's not a plan that you can write out. It's not a formula that you can come up with. 
It's not participating in some type of seminar so that you go from stage one to stage two to stage three. No. It is only done by the transforming power of the Word of God. God gives to us in His Word that everything that we need to go from the, 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 chi the, the child stage to the adolescent stage to the uh, maturity stage. Found inside the Word of God. So we must grow. Second thing that He points out to us here is that we have to understand the world, and once we understand the world, resist the attractions of the world. In, in order for us to be able to resist as Christians the attraction that the world has to offer, we have to understand the world itself. I, I, I listen to, uh, to pastors, I've listened to theologians, I've read books and all kinds of things on people how Christians must resist the world. Well, how in the world can we resist the attractions of the world if we don't even understand the world that we're even talking about, right? And so with this uh, per, uh, pervasive influence of media that we have today in our world that's bombarding us and make no mistake about it, the majority of it, if not all of the media that's bombarding, is directed at those of us who were born again believers, okay? If you don't believe it, go home. Um, don't spend long on it because you'll be really frustrated. Um, and watch CNN for just a moment. Just, just take an hour in of the news, okay? And listen to what they're saying, okay? What, whatever they're talking about, listen to what they're saying. And look and see, just listen to what they're saying, see if it's not offensive to you as a believer. So the media understands that if they want to change the culture of this world, the way the world thinks, you know what they have to do? They have to change the way believe. They have to attack us as believers. They can reshape the country if they attack believers. They can reshape the world if they attack believers. And so this, this media outlet that's bombarding us from every side is the tug of the world is greater than, than it has ever been right now today. And so what is under discussion that, that John is talking about is this worldliness. The problem with worldliness has it often defined in an unbiblical way. Now I want you to understand in a biblical way what worldliness is. In an unbiblical way, you may have people to say, well, worldliness is when you become so involved in politics. Okay. Now we've been told uh, for the last 15 years now, maybe 20 years, um, the Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. That, that's none of your business. Churches shouldn't be involved in politics. Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. Uh, leaders, Christian leaders shouldn't be involved in politics and all those kinds of things. But there's a reason why they're going after the church. There's a reason why they're going after pastors. There's a reason why they're going after Christians, okay? They want us to be silent. And so what they attack us on is saying, oh, you're worldly if you're involved in politics. Or, you may uh, have seen the attack come from this way. If you send your kids to public school, then you're worldly. <laughs> kids have got to go to private school, your kids got to go to Christian school. If not, then you are a worldly individual. Okay? But I just want to say for the record that you can send your kids to public school, and they can have an influence in public school, and just because you send them to public school don't mean that you're a worldly individual and that they're going to be a worldly individual. Just the same way that you send your kids to private school, to a Christian school, and they can still be impacts and they don't have to be worldly, okay? And so that's the attack that they say to us. Christians, if you're involved in politics, you're worldly. Christians, if you send your kids to public school, then you're worldly. Well, all sorts of things have been identified as worldliness by Christians at one time or another. The problem is this, sometimes the definitions have gone way too far, and sometimes they take us off course. And so John talks about this exhortation here, and he gives to us this command. Listen to what it says in verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Now notice this, the verb is present tense, and it could be translated this way, stop loving the world or don't go on loving the world. Now, how is it that John's telling us over in John 3.16 that God loves the world and yet in this particular passage of Scripture, he's saying, do not love the world. 
John 3, 16, God loves the world. That's what he tells us in this passage of Scripture. For Christians, do not love the world. Well, the answer is found in the New Testament word, world. It doesn't just have one meaning. It has multiple meanings, or at least three meanings found in the New Testament. Here's meaning number one of the word world in the New Testament. Sometimes the word world means physical world or earth in the New Testament. I'll give you a good example. Acts chapter 17, verse 24. God made the world and all things therein. It's talking about the physical world. That's the physical world. God made the world the physical world. The second definition of world is in the, in, in the New Testament uh, that the world symbolizes humans or mankind. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, and he gave the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay? It's talking about human beings, the word world, human beings. Matter of fact, he gives us a command to go out and evangelize the world. That's human beings that he's talking about. And then the third meaning found in the New Testament is this. Uh, it can be used in the sense of world system. In other words, when we're talking about the wide world of sports. The world of sports. What does that encompass? That encompass every sport that you can think of, the world of sports. The world of finance. The world of politics. There's not just this separate world of physical sense, but there's this organization or this, this organization, organized system that he's talking about that's made up of its own activities, that's made up of its own purposes and values that that system encompasses. The world of sports has its own values, has its own purposes, and the system has its own values. What John is saying here is the world in its own system, its own values, we as Christians cannot be fooled because the world with its own system and values is hostile to the kingdom of God. And I want to tell you this, that many today have been fooled by the world system and the world values. We've gotten too caught up in the world system and the world's values. And so the word world is used here in the third sense. You and I as Christians are to reject the world, the conduct of the world, and apply Christian biblical values to the way that we live our lives. So we must understand the world's values, what the world really, really means. But there's a problem. Here's the problem that we have. It's not just as easy as saying, I recognize and understand it, but the problem with us as human beings is that our tendency is always to love the world. Now theologians hate when we say that. But I don't do this. You know what my tendency is as a human being? The same tendency that you have. And that's to love the world. The value system that the world offers. We get caught up in it. We live in it every day. And so our tendency is to be drawn towards what the world has to offer. And we have to understand that there are two choices that every one of us have to make. We either love the Father or we love the world. There's not three choices. There's not four choices. There's not many choices. There's only two choices that the Bible gives us. And it says that you and I as God's people have to nail it down. We're either going to love the Father or we're going to love the world. And there's a threefold description of what John uh, is saying here. That the pressure that the world's putting upon us tries to get us not to live for God. Pressure. And sometimes we, we, we don't understand it. So let me, let me break it down this way. There's this physical pressure that the world puts on us that we sometimes refer to it as the lust of the flesh, all right? That's the physical pressure that the world's putting on us, the lust of the flesh. And then there's the lust of the eye, which is the mental pressure, the things that we look at, the things that we see, the things that we hear, the things that we take into our minds is the mental pressure. And then there's the pride of life, which is the spiritual pressure that is put upon us. And all three of these, in their certain uh, ordinary ways have their own appeals to the normal appetites that we find them appealing to tempt to us to appeal, saying, I'm going to satisfy these things. 
Okay? So you really have to fight to, to, to not satisfy the lust of the flesh. Now, if you say, I, I don't have a problem with that at all, then God bless you. You're probably not being real honest or you're a hermit and you don't get out and watch TV, listen to anything whatsoever. But the lust of the flesh is something that's real that we deal with that we really have to fight against. Paul gives us this idea of what the flesh is really about. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, here's what he said. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the result is very clear. Listen to what he said. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, sorcery hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, self-ambition, dissensions, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. So what, what he is saying here is here's all of these things that are examples of the lust of the flesh that are going against the kingdom of God, that we have to battle that are out there. These things that he's talking about here draws us away from the Father, and when they draw us away from the Father, they can keep us from fellowshipping with Almighty God. Matter of fact, when those particular things, the lust of the flesh, draw us away, it's literally impossible to have fellowship with the Father. And what, and what the lust of the flesh is, a good definition is this, is taking good natural desires that God gives to all of us to the extreme. Look at all of those. God-given desires given to all of us, but they're taken to the extreme. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the lust of the eye is this. It's the greedy cravings that you want whatever it is that you see. Greedy cravings. The lust of the eyes. The pride of life. It's the pride uh, that when one has or does not have it, he wants it. It leads to overconfidence. It makes one lose any notion that they are totally dependent upon the Father. The pride of life. I've arrived at where I'm at. I can handle everything myself. I don't need anybody else. I don't even need the Father. I'm there. The pride of life. Let me give you one example. A biblical example, Old Testament example of how uh, all of these take place and how they're tied in, and maybe you can see it and pick it out. Genesis chapter 3. The life of Eve. Let me read it to you. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, God has intent, or has indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the Fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Verse 4 Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing all good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree that it was good for food, the lust of the eyes, or excuse me, the lust of the flesh, when she saw the tree that it was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, lust of the eyes, and the tree desirable was desirable to make one wise, the pride of life, she took the fruit and she ate it. <laughs> All three of those. It appealed to her flesh. She saw it with her eyes. She desired it by the pride of life. And she did exactly what God said don't do, and she knew she wasn't supposed to. She ate the fruit. She's arrived. I don't need anybody else. I don't even need you to tell me what I'm supposed to do. I know what's best for me. And don't forget, not only did she eat it, but she took it and gave it to her husband, who ate it as well. And so you can see in the biblical account, just that one biblical account, all three different ploys of the world is trying to tear down somebody who's living for the Father. We have to be aware of those. And then we see the same three temptations when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And someone said, oh yeah, you know, you can, you can talk about that Old Testament stuff with Eve over there because, you know, she's like one of us. Well, guess what? <laughs> In the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, the same thing happened. Oh, oh yeah, what I'm saying, 
the Messiah, the Son of the living God, who's walking on this earth, and the same thing happens to him. Matthew chapter 4. Satan said, command that these stones become bread. <laughs> the lust of the flesh. Hey, you can do it. Command those stones to become bread. Satan showed them all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. He showed them to the, to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The lust of the eyes. Verse number 9. And Satan offered all these things. He said, I will give to you the pride of life. Did it to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't take the bait like he did, like we do. He resisted. He knew. But it didn't stop him from going after the Son of God himself the same way that he goes after us. And so this worldliness is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of love. Let me give you a simple definition. Worldliness is whatever takes us away from what God has called us to do. That's worldliness. Whatever it is. Just try to distract you away from what God wants you to do. You've got to be aware. Once you understand it, then you have to be able to resist it. And then I want to look at the third thing that John gives us here. He gives us reasons not to love the world. Not only does he tell us not to do it, but he gives to us these reasons, two solid reasons given here that it's not a good idea to love the world. First found in verse 15 in verse number 16. It excludes the love of the Father. If anyone loves the world, look at this. The love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. You see, worldliness is the matter of the heart. And what John points out to us in this passage of Scripture is that love for the world and love for the Father are not compatible. I, 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 listen, we've got people who are standing in our pulpits who are teaching God's people that they can have both. But I want you to understand this. Nowhere in the Scripture does it say that we can have both. And nowhere in the Scripture does it say that love of the Father and love of the world are compatible. They are incompatible. To the extent that a Christian loves the Father or loves the world and the system that the world has, it literally means this. When I'm in love with what the world has to offer me, I am not loving the Father. Matter of fact, when I grasp a hold of what the world has to offer me, and I love that which the world has to offer me, I'm saying to the Father, I don't love you at all. That's what I'm saying. That's what the Scripture teaches us. And so don't, don't have this idea that, oh, well, you know, it's okay, we can dabble in a little bit of the world, still love God too. No, no, they're incompatible. For the love of the world, the things of the world, are love that's stolen away from the Father. Jesus gives us a warning himself. That's what he says. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. Notice this. Jesus did not say you should not serve God and man. You know what he says? You cannot. If Jesus says we cannot, guess what? It's not up for debate, and I don't care what pastor says it. It doesn't make it right, and it never will be compatible when we love the things of the world that we love the Father as well. They're incompatible. So we simply have to choose. You have to live for God, you have to live for the world. That's it. In that very moment in your life, you can't say, I'm washing the blood of Jesus, and whatever I do is okay. I just be caught up in the world and still show God how much I love him. Doesn't happen. Won't ever happen. Biblically impossible. Spiritually impossible. According to God's word. We can never be involved, caught up in the world system, loving the things of the world, and loving the Father as well. There's this unmistakable line that differentiates 
between the things of God and the things of this world. I'll give you a modern day example. Today, the world says that the traditional family should be expanded to include a relationship between two men or two women. That's what the world says. And so I'll go on record and say this. For every church who has embraced the doctrine or changed their doctrine or whatever else, that says because we want to please the Father and we have such a loving Father that now we embrace a union between man and man and woman and woman. It's not biblical. It will never be biblical. And God will never put his stamp of approval on it regardless of what we say or do. And as far as I'm concerned, if you're going to embrace that and change the name and say, we're not a church, we're just a group. Embracing certain values, some of those may be biblical. But that's the, that's the modern day example. The world tells us that you have no right to you ought to expand it and ought to include that. Now we'll say this, as Christians, our responsibility is not to treat individuals who choose to be in a union between two men and two women any different. So that, we're not the judge. They ask us, tell them our biblical opinion, tell them what the Bible says. But we're not to shun them to the point to where we don't love them and care for them, that's not, what the, that's not the goal of the scriptures. But make no mistake about it. If you embrace that theology or that thought, there's absolutely no way that it joins hands with loving the fault at all. The second reason that John gives us for it not being a good idea to love the world is this. The world's temporary. Look at verse 17. And the world is passing away the lust of it, but he, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Yep. The world's passing away right before our eyes. Matter of fact, 2 Peter chapter 3 describes it a good way. Listen to what he says. The heavens will pass away with a great noise. One night this week, maybe tonight would be a good night. It's kind of cool. We talked about the moon a little bit. Walk outside by yourself. Be quiet and listen to the Father. And start listening to the great noise of this old world passing away. It does good as Christians. We think this place is as alive and well as firm it's going to be here for as long as people can even imagine. And the truth of the scripture is this world is passing away with a great noise. The elements will pass with a fervent heat and both the earth and the works that are in it will burn up. And it's happening right now before our eyes. Therefore, since all of these things will be dissolved, what manner of person all to be in a holy conduct and guidance. Yet the world in which we live is on its way out. And based on all the knowledge that we have today, you and I as God's people would be absolutely foolish to place all of our hope and trust in this world that is passing on by. We'd be foolish to be attracted to what it has to offer when it's melting away and burning away before our eyes. Yeah. Someone once described it this way, I think it hits the nail on the head, a visual picture and get it. They said when we pin our hopes on what this world has to offer, it's much the, much the same situation as the passengers aboard the Titanic. You got that picture of those folks on the Titanic? <coughs> Before the tragedy happened, all indications were they were having the time of their life. It was great. Everything was absolutely marvelous. Couldn't be any better. And that great time that they were having was what? Cut short really quick. Matter of fact, 
cut shorter than anybody that was aboard that, that massive ship and cut short beyond anybody that knew anything about that ship. It stopped. And that's the picture of our world today. And so the question is this. What in the world am I, what in the world are you pinning your hopes on? Matter of fact, what is the purpose that I'm living my life? And what's the purpose for you living your life? Are we hanging on to something that we know for a fact is temporary? Or as Christians, have we made up our minds, I'm going to be in this world physically because I have no choice. Make no mistake about it. You have no choice. If you're alive and well today, you're in the world physically, every one of us. But we're commanded not to be in the world of the world spirits. And that's the decision we have to make. Am I going to get up and go along with what all the world has? Am I going to go along with the wind and the waves, with the flow of life? Or am I going to wake up every day and understand, i got to be here physically because I don't have a choice. I'm not going to be a part of this world spiritually. Spiritually. And that's a choice that all of us have to make. Caution. The world is out to get you. Would you stand with me this morning with your head bowed and your eyes closed? Maybe you're here this morning and you've never placed your faith in trust in Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. He loves you so much that our minds, my mind, can't even comprehend. When I think about all the things that he has done for me and that he did for me, my mind can't comprehend it. Except to say it's an incredible love that I can never, ever mimic in my life. I don't love you enough to die in your place. I don't love you enough to die for your sins. I don't love you enough to be a sacrifice for your sins. But he did. And he does still today love you. And if you'll be willing to embrace him, admit that you're a sinner, embrace him, and turn to him and say yes. I believe what all in my heart truly the Son of God. And I want you to forgive me my sins, and I want you to be my Savior and Lord. The Bible gives you a wonderful promise that at that very moment He'll save you. You may be here this morning, and you're like me, you know for a fact you've been washed in the blood of Jesus. And everything that we've talked about this morning, you like me, know what it's like to be caught up in the world, living for the world, and how miserable it is. Sometimes it's exciting, but so miserable because we know it's temporary we know it separates us from the love of the Father if you're like me when you get caught up in it you want to kick yourself every time because you know better I want to challenge you to learn more about this world and how it tries to entice us for the purpose of being able to resist it no, I'm not I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to say that. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. It's not pleasing to the Father. And just know that we have to denounce those thoughts, that theology that says, oh yeah, you can still have all the world has to offer and you can still have all that God has to offer to you. It's not biblical, never will be biblical, and it never will be acceptable to the Father. Never. One or the other. One or the other. There may be other decisions that need to be made. It's very tempting to play and sing our good meditation. God's speaking to you. Will you trust him?